In January, I marked my 48th birthday, a milestone that usually calls for a celebration with my wife of 22 years. Historically, she organized festive gatherings to honor this occasion, filled with friends and family. However, the trajectory of our relationship took a significant downturn when she decided to join a co-ed baseball league comprised predominantly of men. This decision, made nearly a year ago, set off a chain of events that would ultimately contribute to the unraveling of our marriage. My wife, now 42, has undergone notable physical changes, particularly during the COVID-19 lockdown. While working from home, she struggled with weight gain, despite her earnest attempts to maintain a healthy lifestyle through home workouts and dieting. Unfortunately, the results did not reflect her efforts, and the extended period confined to our home took a toll on her mental and emotional well-being. With our children having moved out, it became increasingly evident that we were left alone together, a shift that I did not take lightly. Rather than express my frustrations, I offered my unwavering support, recognizing that such changes are often part of the aging process. Truthfully, I have never been in peak physical condition, and my wife has always been the more attractive one, someone who relishes compliments and enjoys dressing well for public outings. Her career in marketing has instilled in her a keen awareness of the importance of image and first impressions. When COVID restrictions began to ease, she felt a strong desire to re-engage in social activities. We spent considerable time discussing her options, ultimately settling on registering for a baseball group via an online platform called Meetup, which connects individuals with local activities. After evaluating various alternatives, we agreed that the baseball team, which met three times a week, would be the most suitable choice. I expressed interest in joining her, but my demanding work schedule as a plumber, where I often had late nights and long hours, made it impractical. My wife often accuses me of being a workaholic, but I've always found satisfaction in completing tasks and immersing myself in my work. Currently, I am employed by a friend, having previously operated my own plumbing business. The stress and responsibilities of running my own enterprise became overwhelming, leading me to prefer a simpler role where I could focus on my work and return home without the burden of additional management tasks. I vividly recall the first game my wife attended. Exhaustion overtook her, and her muscles were sore from the exertion. I helped soothe her discomfort by massaging her feet and thighs that evening. Her enthusiastic recounting of the experience provided a glimpse into her renewed sense of enjoyment. However, as the weeks went by, it became increasingly evident that a particular player named Craig began to dominate our conversations. She frequently mentioned him, identifying him as the best player on the team, yet characterized him as a controlling individual, which seemed to irk her. She described him as obnoxious and a notorious flirt, prone to disparaging his ex-wife, even though no one had met her. His personal history was extensive, having endured multiple divorces and earning a reputation as a muscle car enthusiast. As my wife continued to attend games, her disclosures about Craig deepened. Her initial complaints about his flirtatious behavior evolved into concerns about his smoking habits. She expressed her dismay that he encouraged some team members to partake in smoking after games, despite the league comprising individuals well into their forties. With each passing week, she shared more details about Craig. After a month of playing baseball, while she regained some physical fitness, her issues with Craig persisted. New revelations emerged about his involvement in dealing illicit substances, a detail that both shocked and unsettled her. According to her, he would introduce samples to players and convert them into customers, blurring the lines between casual enjoyment and addiction. Craig's story included a past as a minor league player with aspirations of going pro, until a serious accident while drag racing altered his trajectory. His life was marked by a tumultuous relationship with substance misuse, reflecting a fast-paced lifestyle that seemed at odds with her own. Curiosity compelled me to inquire how my wife had gathered such intimate knowledge about Craig's background and character. She explained that he was notoriously talkative and often bragged about his life experiences. Despite his troubling behavior, she noted that many people in the group admired him for his charisma and humor, which only added to her frustration. She reiterated that, for her, he was not amusing at all. I distinctly remember a particular night when she returned home reeking of marijuana. I was taken aback and asked her why she smelled that way. She casually mentioned that she had spent time with teammates after the game, indulging in smoking together. Initially, I had no reason to question her account. However, the pattern continued, every time she came back from games, the smell became more familiar, as if it were woven into the fabric of her newfound social life, which revolved around this group of players. Upon returning home after one of her games, she carried with her the unmistakable scent of marijuana. 
It was a striking odor that immediately caught my attention. After she took a shower, I joined her, and in the warmth of that shared space, we found ourselves growing intimate. As our lips met, the taste of smoke was evident, a clear indication of her recent indulgence. Seized by curiosity and concern, I asked her directly if she had been smoking. She confessed that she had tried it once because it was being passed around among her peers, and she felt undue pressure to partake, fearing it would be awkward if she abstained. In that moment, my frustration boiled over. The atmosphere shifted drastically as I confronted her about her actions. We have three adult children, a 23-year-old son, a 21-year-old daughter, and an 18-year-old son, and her behavior felt hypocritical. She had always emphasized the importance of steering clear of smoking and resisting peer pressure, yet here she was, engaging in precisely the behavior she had cautioned our children against. I questioned her about what she would think if our kids decided to mimic her actions and succumb to the same peer pressures she had faced. Her response was dismissive, she told me to calm down, minimizing the incident as a one-time experience and insisted she hadn't even inhaled. Rather than escalating the situation into an argument where I would lecture her on substance use, despite her history of disciplining our children regarding such issues, I chose silence. I have never been one for confrontation, preferring to maintain peace in our household. Yet, witnessing her act in such a contradictory manner was unsettling. It made me reflect on the changes she had undergone, pondering who had influenced her to partake in smoking, especially when she had vehemently condemned it herself. The fact that she had spent nearly a month lamenting the negative impact of a particular individual, then casually experimented with his product was troubling. In the following weeks, it became evident that she continued to use cannabis, attempting to conceal it by showering, washing her sports attire, and brushing her teeth after each encounter. Still, the lingering odor became increasingly difficult to ignore. My instinct was to confront her again, but I hesitated, recognizing that she would likely deny it or offer a weak rationalization. In a twisted way, I found some solace in knowing I had something that could counter her typical self-righteousness. As Thanksgiving approached, our three children visited, but my wife's absence was glaring and uncharacteristic. Typically, she took pride in preparing a bountiful Thanksgiving feast and hosting large gatherings of family and friends, cooking more food than we could possibly consume. This year, however, she was absent all day. When she finally returned, I casually inquired about her whereabouts. She informed me that she had been visiting friends but then mentioned car troubles as the reason for her extended absence, claiming she had taken her vehicle to Craig for repairs. Skepticism colored my response, as her explanation seemed insufficient, especially given the significance of family gatherings during the holiday season. I pressed her further, reminding her that Thanksgiving was just around the corner and that her focus should have been on spending time with our family, not dealing with vehicle issues. I pointed out that most people prioritize their families over car repairs during a holiday meant for togetherness. She insisted that she had informed our daughter about her lateness and advised her to prepare the meal in her absence. Our children began to notice the shift in her behavior as well. They suggested that our family was experiencing marital distress, believing the frequent arguments were indicative of deeper issues. This concern was compounded by her increasing excuses and failures to fulfill her usual Thanksgiving responsibilities. On the day itself, our daughter found it overwhelming to manage everything alone, and during this time, my wife proclaimed that she was unwell and retired to bed shortly after her mechanical excursion. For the first time in years, I found myself taking our children to a restaurant for Thanksgiving dinner, a significant departure from our typical family celebration. My wife remained in bed, and I had to persuade her to join us at the restaurant. She requested that I tell the children she was sick, but I insisted she should inform them herself. The last thing I wanted was to explain to our children why their mother was preoccupied with new friendships, indulgence in smoking, and neglecting her duties. Balancing work and family had always been my responsibility, yet her recent actions left me feeling helpless and uncertain about the future of our family dynamics. At that moment, the thought of infidelity had not even entered my mind. My daughter stepped into the room and immediately sensed something was off with her mother's demeanor. Concerned, she began to piece together her mother's behavior, recognizing that it strayed from the norm. Eventually, my wife managed to pull herself together and act as if everything was fine, though the facade was unconvincing. During our visit to the restaurant, my children observed their mother's unusual disposition. She made awkward jokes, her laughter felt forced, and overall, she appeared emotionally disconnected, as if she were present in body but absent in spirit, compelled to join us rather than willingly participating in the family outing. After we left the restaurant, my daughter made a light-hearted remark, 
playfully questioning what I had done to her mother, highlighting her perception that my wife's comportment was entirely uncharacteristic. Additionally, my daughter noted a significant change in my wife's physical appearance, she had lost a considerable amount of weight, which raised concerns about whether this drastic change was somehow connected to her altered behavior. In a moment of transparency, I chose to confide in my daughter. I revealed that her mother had recently joined a baseball team, formed new and unconventional friendships, and had begun using pills alongside these acquaintances. This troubling behavior had developed over the course of four months following her decision to join the team. My daughter reacted initially with disbelief, as my wife's actions seemed so out of alignment with the woman we both knew. After the Thanksgiving holiday had concluded and the children had returned to their own lives, I felt compelled to address the situation with my wife directly. I initiated a conversation about the pressing need for change in her behavior, firmly expressing that she could not continue to act as though she were living a carefree college life. At this juncture, the idea of an affair still had not crossed my mind. My unwavering trust in her made it nearly impossible to fathom that she could betray me in such a profound manner. The situation took a more troubling turn when I noticed irregularities in our shared bank account. A notification popped up on my phone, alerting me that $1,200 had been withdrawn unexpectedly, depleting our funds used to cover essential recurring expenses such as groceries and utilities. Concerned, I attempted to contact my wife, but she did not answer her phone. Completing my work assignment became secondary, and I cancelled the following assignment for the day in favor of heading home to discern what was troubling her. Upon my arrival, I noticed a classic 1964 Pontiac GTO parked on the street, a vehicle I had never encountered before. My passion for classic cars heightened my awareness of this unfamiliar model. After parking my own car in the driveway, directly behind my wife's, I approached the front door to enter the house. It was then that I noticed evidence of hasty movement a clear indication that someone had recently exited through the door leading to the backyard. Assuming it was my wife, given that her car was in the driveway and that she had been home since her office job was altered due to the easing of COVID-19 restrictions, I prepared to confront her about the unauthorized bank withdrawal and her lack of communication. However, as I moved toward the door, I heard the unmistakable sound of it slamming shut, which heightened my urgency. In my haste, I opened the door to the backyard, and the sound of the backyard fence creaking open reached my ears. This startled me, as it indicated that someone had fled the scene. The speed at which they reached the fence further convinced me that this was not my wife but rather an intruder or someone trying to evade me. My calculations around the timing of events suggested urgency in their exit, and the layout of the house obscured my view of the yard from the entrance until I physically stepped outside. By the time I reached the backyard and swung the gate open, the person had disappeared completely. A thorough scan of the surrounding area revealed an unmistakable scent of marijuana lingering in the air, suggesting that someone had been smoking there not long ago. Just then, I heard my wife's voice calling out to me from inside the house, prompting me to rush back to her. When I found her, she appeared as if she had just stepped out of the shower, a stark contrast to the chaos I had just witnessed. I inquired about the individual I suspected had been smoking in our backyard. My wife firmly denied that anyone had been present, insisting that she had smoked there earlier out of consideration for my aversion to the odor. Her response was laden with dishonesty, and it was evident to me that she was not telling the truth. The discrepancies in her words and actions fueled my growing suspicion that something far more troubling was happening within the fabric of our family life. Over the past five months, my wife's increasingly unusual behavior has raised significant concerns, particularly regarding her interactions with others and her willingness to welcome strangers into our home. This situation compelled me to confront her about what I perceived as a serious breach of trust. I directly questioned her about the possibility of an affair, especially in light of an incident involving someone who had hastily left our property. Her reaction was one of indignation. She vehemently denied any wrongdoing and seemed to struggle to understand the implications of my inquiries, as if my words had been lost on her. When I pressed her further about her recent silence in response to my calls, along with a troubling $1,200 withdrawal from our joint account, which we ordinarily relied upon to cover our household expenses, she maintained that she had lent the money to a friend facing financial difficulties, asserting that repayment would come soon. At that moment, I felt an overwhelming sense of confusion. Her explanation seemed increasingly improbable, sounding akin to the justifications of a gambler or someone who was neglecting their responsibilities in favor of more frivolous pursuits. I questioned her rationale, asking if her friend perceived her as a financial institution, and expressed my dismay that she had not consulted me regarding such a significant withdrawal. Her response to my concerns was irritation, she dismissed my worries with a manner that suggested I was overreacting. 
In a stern tone, I warned her of the potential consequences if she continued to lend our money freely without mutual agreement. I made it clear that I expected the funds to be returned to our account by the following day. That evening, seeking clarity, I meticulously reviewed our bank statements. What I discovered was troubling, she was not contributing her fair share to our finances. Given that a substantial portion of her income derived from commissions, it became evident she was only contributing a fraction of what was expected, which explained our dwindling account balance and the unexpected withdrawal. During our subsequent discussion about this financial disparity, it emerged that she was intentionally limiting her work hours, contributing only the bare minimum required to retain her position. I was compelled to ask what she was occupying herself with when she wasn't working. In response, she offered a series of excuses, claiming exhaustion from rigorous workouts and sporting activities aimed at weight loss. She argued that with the children no longer in the house, our financial concerns were less pressing. In light of her reduced income and the unwarranted expenditures, I conveyed that if she chose to limit her working hours, she should refrain from lending our money to friends and reconsider the time spent with her new acquaintances, whom I referred to dismissively as her MJ buddies. I insisted that she needed to cut back on her sports activities and presented her with an ultimatum, it was either our marriage or her sports. Her reaction was immediate and vehement. She launched into a tirade of insults, attacking my character by labeling me as insecure and accusing me of lacking masculinity. I reiterated the seriousness of the situation by stating that if she insisted on prioritizing her sporting pursuits over our marriage, we might reach a point of no return after more than 22 years together. She reacted with fury, asserting that my willingness to consider divorce over what she perceived as a trivial issue was unacceptable. Suggesting that I might benefit from speaking with someone, she implied that I was being overly emotional and immature. I pointed out that she had fundamentally changed from the person I had married, noting that since engaging in these new activities and forming connections with a different social circle, her responsibilities at home had withered. Household chores, cooking, and general upkeep had evidently fallen by the wayside, replaced by pursuits that seemed more reminiscent of a college dropout than a devoted spouse. She accused me of being jealous of her newfound appearance and lifestyle, which only intensified my frustration. With a sharp retort, she stormed out of the room as we engaged in a heated argument that lasted throughout the night, culminating in my choice to sleep on the couch. The following day, her silence was palpable. She refused to engage with me or prepare meals, seemingly hoping to provoke an apology from me that would permit her to continue her current trajectory. In a troubling disregard for the serious financial issue we faced, we exchanged no words that day. The next day coincided with one of her baseball games. As I was readying myself for work, she sought to gauge my commitment to the discussions surrounding our marriage, loudly declaring her intent to act according to her desires and claiming that I had no right to interfere with her pursuit of happiness. I chose not to respond, dressing quietly before departing the house, leaving the tension unresolved. In the early afternoon, I made the decisive choice to contact a divorce attorney with the specific aim of drafting a formal separation agreement. My intention behind this action was to deliver a shocking revelation to my wife, hoping that the gravity of the situation would prompt her to reconsider the impact of her recent behavior on our family. Whether one might attribute her actions to a midlife crisis or the effects of menopause, I believe that serving her with divorce papers could serve as a wake-up call, potentially jarring her from the path she was on. The attorney efficiently prepared the necessary legal documents, and I collected them after finishing my work for the day. Upon returning home, I discovered that my wife was not present, leaving me uncertain about her whereabouts. When she finally arrived, I quickly observed that she was not dressed for the baseball game she had previously planned to attend. This was crucial because my objective was to serve her the divorce papers, making it abundantly clear that I was resolute in my decision. I hoped that, despite our ongoing challenges, she might choose not to sign the papers, as my feelings for her had not diminished, and I was not ready to relinquish our relationship without a fight. It was my desire for her to fully grasp the seriousness of the situation and understand that a divorce could leave her isolated and without support. As she entered through the front door, I waited in the living room for her to pass by, but she continued to ignore me, opting instead to head to the kitchen in silence to prepare her own meal. Taking a deep breath, I rose from the couch to retrieve the divorce papers and approached her as she was still in the kitchen. When I handed her the documents, I was momentarily taken aback by the astonishment reflected on her face, her eyes widened, and her mouth fell open, capturing the unexpected nature of my actions. However, her reaction escalated quickly, she pushed me away and tossed the papers at me in disbelief, unable to comprehend that I had followed through with such a drastic step. 
In tears, she stormed out of the kitchen, expressing her disbelief and sorrow over my decision to initiate divorce proceedings, even as she had chosen not to attend the baseball game. Left standing in the kitchen, the divorce papers littered across the floor, I felt an unexpected sense of satisfaction. Everything had transpired as I had anticipated. I collected the scattered papers and carefully returned them to their folder, harboring the hope that this confrontation had provided my wife the necessary shock to reevaluate her priorities. That evening, a call from my daughter brought a new perspective to the scenario. She inquired about the reasons behind my decision to divorce her mother, framing the issue as being related to the baseball game. It soon became evident that my wife had confided in our daughter, airing her grievances about me. In that moment, I recognized that I had made progress, I understood my wife well enough to know that her embarrassment prevented her from confronting me directly, prompting her use of our daughter as an intermediary. I explained the situation to my daughter, referencing her visit during Thanksgiving when she observed her mother's unusual behavior. Notably, my daughter expressed that it did not seem like her mother was involved in an affair and encouraged me to navigate this challenging period alongside my wife. The following day, a surprise awaited me. My wife prepared breakfast and lunch for me, an act she had not performed in nearly six months. She expressed remorse for the difficulties she had caused and assured me that she intended to amend her behavior going forward. Claiming to have engaged in self-reflection, she admitted to recognizing the flaws in her actions. I responded by offering her a month to demonstrate her commitment to change, cautioning her that if her behavior persisted, particularly her smoking and time spent with friends, I would have no option but to continue with the divorce. Additionally, I reminded her of the necessity to repay the funds borrowed from my account, to which she readily agreed. We reached a tentative reconciliation, and I left for work feeling a mixture of hope and caution. The next evening, upon my return, my wife initiated another conversation. She opened up about the overwhelming stress she had been experiencing, largely attributed to the adverse effects of the pandemic on her work life, compounded by my own demanding job schedule. In a moment of vulnerability, she acknowledged that she had been seeking an escape from these pressures. While initially, attending the baseball game provided her with temporary relief, she eventually succumbed to the allure of marijuana, finding it helped her relax and manage anxiety. For the first time, she shared her struggle with depression and the medication she had been taking to cope with it. To my surprise, she disclosed that her use of marijuana had gradually diminished her reliance on traditional antidepressants. Marking a significant admission in our ongoing dialogue and signaling a potential new path forward for both of us. I inquired about the individual who had been in our backyard and subsequently fled the scene. In response, she insisted that there was no one present, but her demeanor indicated a lack of honesty. As the conversation progressed, she expressed remorse about a recent financial withdrawal, asking me not to take offense. She explained that the money had been used to purchase marijuana, indicating a need for a longer time frame to replace what had been spent. My emotions were turbulent, although I felt profoundly upset and concerned, I recognized the importance of preserving the moment. My wife appeared to be undergoing a significant realization, evoking a glimmer of hope that perhaps this moment of vulnerability would signal a return to the woman I once knew. In the days that followed, life returned to a semblance of normalcy, as though we had slipped back into our established routine. I came to accept that my wife's marijuana use might persist, as she argued it was a coping mechanism for her anxiety and depression. I reassured her that while her smoking was a concern, it was primarily the individuals from whom she procured the substance that troubled me. Given that marijuana was illegal in our state, she took to smoking clandestinely, making efforts to keep her habit hidden from my view. To avoid escalating tensions, I chose not to confront her directly, which inadvertently led her to believe she was successfully concealing her activities. With this newfound sense of secrecy, she began picking up extra hours at work, contributing modestly more to our shared finances. However, her contributions did not approach the levels she had maintained previously. I found myself shouldering the bulk of our financial obligations, particularly the mortgage and other essential expenses, which left me covering approximately 70 to 80 percent of our total bills. One evening, while we were engaged in watching television together, her cell phone rang, prompting her to answer and retreat to another room. From there, I could hear her laughter, which felt out of place. Minutes later, she returned to the couch, and I inquired about the identity of the caller. Her defensive response was immediate, informing me it was merely a friend. This reaction struck me as suspicious, raising concerns about her openness. On another occasion, I arrived home earlier than expected and made my way to the refrigerator to grab a beer, only to find it absent. 
With just the two of us in the house, and considering that my wife did not drink beer, I began to ponder the reasons behind its disappearance. It was conceivable that she had cleared space in the refrigerator, but that explanation seemed far-fetched. This incident fueled my suspicions that she could be inviting someone over without my knowledge. As the holiday season approached, Christmas unfolded with my children observing that my wife's behavior had improved compared to Thanksgiving. However, I remained skeptical, sensing that her cheerful demeanor was merely a facade. In January, she reverted to her previous patterns, excessive smoking, prolonged daytime sleep, and decreased work hours. When my birthday arrived, there was no gesture of celebration, no surprise party, no gifts, and no desire to dine out in honor of the occasion. As my children reached out to wish me a happy birthday, I gently reminded my wife of her lapse in memory regarding the day. To my surprise, she expressed that she had genuinely forgotten. When I pointed out her excessive smoking and its potential impact on her memory, she responded by saying she had noted it on her calendar but simply let it slip her mind. She apologized profusely, though it did little to assuage my growing concerns. During one of my sessions with a client, I became acquainted with the Ring doorbell, which permitted real-time monitoring of visitors at the front door through a smartphone connection. This innovative device piqued my interest, and I realized its potential utility in my own home for discreetly observing my wife's daily activities and the individuals she welcomed into our lives. Consequently, I purchased and installed a Ring doorbell. Initially, my wife paid little attention to the new gadget, perceiving it as just another one of my numerous technological acquisitions, which she often dismissed as trivial. The device was seamlessly integrated into our Wi-Fi network, allowing me to receive notifications whenever someone approached our door. Additionally, it recorded video footage that I could access at any time for review. On the first day following its installation, while I was occupied at work, I received a motion-activated video notification from the Ring doorbell. Caught up in my tasks, I was unable to check my phone for an entire hour, unknowingly setting the stage for what I would later discover. Upon checking the Ring notification, I was met with the unsettling image of a man standing at our front door. To my dismay, it quickly became apparent that there was no need for him to knock, my wife was already there, eagerly awaiting his arrival. As she opened the door and welcomed him inside, the realization struck me that she clearly recognized him. A flood of thoughts surged through my mind, the most troubling of which was the possibility that this man could be the same individual who had previously sprinted through my backyard. The one who had been brazenly helping himself to my beard during my absence. This could potentially be Craig, the supplier of marijuana to my wife, or even worse, the person with whom she might be engaging in an affair. In a panic, I immediately checked the real-time camera feed, only to confirm that the man had not yet exited my house, he remained inside. With 30 minutes to drive back home and unable to focus on my current task, I hastily informed my client that I needed to return and then sped towards my residence, urgency fueling my every movement. As I drove, I monitored the ring camera on my phone, but the video feed proved unreliable, freezing intermittently and leaving me with an uneasy sense of anxiety. It was a struggle to concentrate on the road while grappling with the mounting emotions inside me, but I pressed on, desperate to confront whatever awaited me upon my arrival. When I finally reached home, I found only my wife's car parked in the driveway, intensifying my sense of foreboding. I dashed inside, making a beeline for the master bedroom, only to find it empty. The bed was in disarray, and the air in the room felt heavy, whether from my wife's recent shower or simply stagnant, I could not tell. She was nowhere to be found, nor was the man whose presence had unsettled me so deeply. My instincts kicked in, and I checked the closet and looked under the bed, but my search yielded nothing. Just then, I heard the sound of the backyard door opening, prompting me to rush downstairs, convinced that the man might still be attempting to escape, just as he had before. As I descended halfway down the stairway, my wife unexpectedly emerged from her home office located just off the kitchen. Her expression was one of shock, her eyes wide with what appeared to be an instinctual fear, as if she had encountered a ghost. I noted that she was wearing nothing but a white robe, an image that did not sit well with me given the circumstances. She asked me, with a hint of disbelief, why I was home early and what had made me appear so anxious. I quickly collected my thoughts, striving to maintain a facade of normalcy, unwilling to reveal my suspicions about a man who had just been in our home and possibly involved with her. As the realization sunk in that I had narrowly missed confronting them, I opted not to confront her directly, knowing that she would likely deny everything, even in the face of irrefutable evidence, such as the footage from the ring camera. Instead, I decided that patience would serve me better, allowing me to capture them in the act if it came to that. 
I sensed a flicker of suspicion in her eyes, as if she could sense something was amiss but could not identify its source. To distract her, I fabricated an excuse about needing a specific tool, a Makita cordless metal hole punch, despite her evident lack of familiarity with such equipment. I was determined to project an air of normality while she seemed to study my reactions closely. I descended into the basement, selected a random tool to minimize suspicion, and then returned to the main area of the house. She stood there, almost paralyzed in disbelief, her demeanor resembling someone caught in a trance. As I approached her, I leaned in and gave her a casual kiss on the cheek, a gesture that usually signified routine affection. However, as I came closer, it became increasingly apparent that she had recently smoked, heightening my suspicions further. Pulling back to maintain the guise of normal behavior, I asked her if she was alright, feigning concern despite the storm brewing inside me. She replied with an affirmative yet shaky, yes, and escorted me toward the door. As I made my way to the driveway, my mind raced with questions. How had this man managed to infiltrate our home and depart right under my nose? It seemed highly plausible that this was not the first time the two had met, and I feared I had narrowly escaped discovering them together. The thought lingered that perhaps he was still concealed somewhere within the house, adding another layer of unease to my homecoming. Before departing, I resolved to check the ring footage again to ascertain whether he had finally left. When I reached my car, I glanced back to find my wife still standing at the door, her gaze fixed on me, an expression of confusion etched across her features. I attempted to act as naturally as possible, but once I settled into my work van, a wave of paralyzing anxiety washed over me. I sensed her observing me from the half-open door, so I remained seated, pretending to sift through paperwork while discreetly checking my phone to verify the man's departure from our home. He had indeed left before I arrived home. Just as I settled down to review the ring footage in an effort to piece together the disarray of emotions and circumstances surrounding me, my cell phone rang. It was my friend and employer, inquiring as to why I had vacated the client's residence without completing the work. The client had expressed dissatisfaction, as I was in the midst of a bathroom renovation project that required my full attention. I had contemplated calling it a day, but I realized that bringing in another plumber to continue the work would create complications and inefficiencies. Therefore, I made the decision to return and ensure the job was completed to the client's satisfaction. As I pushed myself through the day's tasks, I found it increasingly challenging to focus. Despite my plumbing skills being instinctual and polished from years of experience, my thoughts continually drifted back to the unsettling reality that my wife was prepared to abandon 22 years of marriage for a marijuana seller. The transformation of my wife from a composed partner with firm traditional values to a regular user of marijuana was beyond my comprehension. She had repeatedly assured me that she would stop her usage once she finished her work commitments. After completing the day's work, the thought of returning home was unbearable. I opted to stay in my van, occupying my mind with considerations about my next steps. Ultimately, I resolved to visit a nearby bar. Even though I did not typically indulge heavily in alcohol, I sought the company of others during this tumultuous time. I ordered a beer and perched myself on a bar stool, lost in thought. It was in this moment that an idea emerged, I would acquire a video recorder and GPS device to install in my wife's car, enabling me to monitor her whereabouts. A visit to a local electronic store proved fruitless as they lacked reputable options. Consequently, I turned to my phone to place an online order but managed to find two voice-activated recorders. My intention was to discreetly place them in our bedroom and my wife's home office. Upon returning home, I was greeted by the smell of my favorite meal, lovingly prepared by my wife. This act of care was reminiscent of the past, particularly during moments when she sensed guilt. I maintained a composed exterior, pretending that everything was as it should be. After a while, I excused myself to take a shower before rejoining her for dinner. During the meal, I remarked on the rarity of her cooking, to which she insisted that she had always done so. We shared a light laugh, yet I made a considerable effort to mask my internal pain and resentment. However, as the evening progressed, the weight of my emotions became too much to bear, urging me to confront her. Instead, I decided to take the dog for a walk, stating my intent to my wife. Walking the dog provided a brief escape, allowing me to clear my mind. I contemplated whether I should reach out to my daughter to inform her of the troubling situation regarding her mother, but I hesitated. I did not want to involve her, fearing that it might complicate my plans to catch my wife in the act. Although I already had some evidence, I sought further confirmation of my suspicions. I had recognized her affair partner from the ring camera footage, a tall, skinny man with brown hair, whose face I could identify without hesitation. 
My desire was to ascertain the extent of their involvement. Upon my return home, my wife was already asleep. The thought of sharing a bed with her, knowing she may have been with her dealer and affair partner just hours prior, felt unbearable. However, sleeping in the guest room would likely raise her suspicions, so I opted to endure my discomfort and remained in our bed. Sleep eluded me that night, and in the early hours, I quietly installed the voice-activated recorders in her office and our bedroom. The following morning, she woke before me and prepared breakfast as if nothing were amiss. It was surprisingly easier for me to maintain the facade this time compared to the previous day at work. Throughout the day, I found myself unable to resist the urge to check the ring camera frequently. Although I had configured notifications to alert me of any movement, my wife only left the house to go grocery shopping, calling to inform me of her whereabouts as she returned with bags in tow. The subsequent days unfolded with minimal activity, as she rarely left home. This led me to question whether something was indeed awry or if she had become aware of my surveillance efforts. On the evening of the third day, after spotting the stranger at my door again, I retrieved the voice-activated recorder from my car and began listening to the recorded conversations. It quickly became apparent that my wife had been spending considerable time on the phone, revealing details that would further unravel the tangled web of my suspicions. My wife had been investing countless hours engaging in lengthy phone conversations with an individual named Craig, who was affiliated with her baseball group. From their exchanges, it became evident that my wife was no longer participating in the games, and instead, she appeared to have formed a close bond with this man. It was alarming to observe that Craig was expressing a desire to come over, yet my wife conveyed her apprehension. She referred to an incident where I had unexpectedly arrived home, which left her feeling uneasy about the prospect of intimacy within our household. The complexity of the situation deepened as I learned that they could not entertain the idea of being intimate at Craig's residence due to the presence of his girlfriend and his three children. Furthermore, Craig was reluctant to spend money on a hotel, subsequently proposing alternative rendezvous points. He suggested meeting in a parking lot, a proposal that my wife outright rejected, articulating her discomfort with such a setting. While she maintained clear boundaries regarding the impropriety of being intimate in a parking lot, she seemed to find the idea of intimacy in our own bed somehow acceptable. In his insistence, Craig proposed that my wife visit his workplace, a location where they had engaged in intimate encounters before. However, she expressed valid concerns over the presence of his business partner, who had caught them during a previous visit over Thanksgiving. Craig co-owns a mechanic shop with this partner, and it was evident that the partner was not in favor of their workplace being used for personal activities. Despite this, Craig remained adamant about wanting my wife to come to his business, seemingly willing to jeopardize both his professional relationship and the integrity of his workplace for the sake of pursuing intimacy with a married woman. From the substance of their conversations, it appeared that my wife was exchanging marijuana for intimacy, or at the very least, receiving it at a discounted rate. This unsettling impression was derived from our interaction as I lay in bed, contemplating the implications of what I had overheard and the next steps I should take in addressing the situation. I became increasingly aware that my plan might have backfired, as my wife had grown suspicious, thereby potentially jeopardizing any opportunity one had to confront her during the anticipated D-Day the following morning. While taking a shower, I devised a strategy to locate my wife's stash of marijuana, fully aware that she had been smoking it regularly. She had been attempting to mask the scent with peppermint and mouthwash, indicating a possible dependence on the substance as a coping mechanism, especially since she was neglecting her prescribed medication. My plan involved finding her stash and disposing of it, which would, in theory, compel her to reach out to Craig for more. The task of locating the stash without drawing attention to my search proved to be a challenge. My wife's daily routine consisted of her being home for extended periods, only venturing out for a couple of hours. Consequently, I realized that a thorough search of the house would be necessary. However, I recalled that my daughter was scheduled to visit for the weekend, allowing me a window of opportunity as they typically spent the entire day at her grandmother's countryside home. This monthly visit was not atypical, providing me with the necessary time to conduct my search without raising suspicion. Leading up to this weekend, I had already returned the voice recorder to my wife's office. The remainder of that week unfolded without incident. When my daughter inquired about her mother's well-being, I assured her that everything was fine, deliberately withholding any details that might inadvertently alert my wife, knowing well that my daughter struggled with keeping secrets. On Friday, I received the GPS tracker and hidden camera I had ordered. The following Saturday morning, with my wife and daughter gone on their trip, I seized the opportunity to listen to the recordings from the voice-activated recorder. 
The information confirmed my suspicions regarding Craig's role in my wife's life, suggesting that he was potentially involved in more than just casual drug dealing. However, while the recordings shed light on Craig's past as a minor league player who had suffered a career-ending injury leading to a dependency on painkillers, they did not clarify whether my wife was using any substances beyond marijuana. What perplexed me further was my inability to understand why she was drawn to someone with such a troubled background, especially considering her generally stable upbringing. Her recent admission regarding struggles with depression threw me into confusion, as I had always perceived her childhood as normal. I began to wonder if her emotional distress had originated from the isolation of being home for prolonged periods, leading to potential issues such as weight gain. Throughout this turbulent examination, the underlying tension remained, my wife continued to harbor suspicions that I was on the verge of uncovering her affair. Her suspicions regarding my awareness of her affair were palpable. When I confronted her about how she came to this realization, she feigned ignorance regarding the sources of my information. However, I suspected that her denial was a strategic maneuver intended to deter him from approaching her, particularly since he was eager to see her before she departed for the weekend with our daughter. In a bid to gather evidence, I took the initiative to install cameras in both the master bedroom and the living room, understanding that these locations would potentially capture critical interactions. My subsequent task involved locating my wife's stash of marijuana, which I believed might be hidden somewhere within our home. I meticulously searched every room, even considering the extreme measure of hiring a sniffer dog to assist in the hunt. However, by the end of the day, I found nothing, leading me to conclude either that she had run out or had taken it with her. Their return was scheduled for Sunday afternoon, and while sitting on the couch that evening watching television, a thought crossed my mind, perhaps the backyard held the key to locating her hidden items. With that idea in mind, I ventured outside shortly before sunset, carefully inspecting the area for any possible hiding spots. I suspected she might have buried her stash, but fortune smiled upon me when I soon discovered a Ziploc bag containing both marijuana and a grinder. Seizing the moment, I disposed of the marijuana down the toilet to eliminate any evidence and discreetly returned the empty bag to its original location. It appeared that she had chosen to hide her stash outdoors to mitigate the risk of detection through odor, especially since she frequently engaged in her activities in the backyard. Moreover, it was worth noting that her affair partner had once made a stealthy exit from that very area. Realizing the potential to monitor her movements more effectively, I decided to relocate the camera from the living room to the backyard, ensuring its placement was discreet so that it would not draw her attention. Once I set up the camera, I performed a test run, which yielded satisfactory results. This development brought a sense of relief, as I now had the means to observe the activities taking place in my home without her being any the wiser. My next step involved installing a GPS device in her car, which I planned to carry out after she returned from her visit to her mother's. When she returned home that Sunday evening, I waited until she had gone to bed before I discreetly installed the GPS device in her vehicle. The following day, my daughter returned to her own home, and during my work hours, I reached out to the same divorce attorney who had previously drafted our separation agreement. I shared the details of my current predicament, including my wife's infidelity and the evidence I had gathered. However, the attorney informed me that this evidence would hold limited weight in our divorce proceedings due to the state's no-fault divorce system. This meant that the only grounds upon which we could file for divorce would be irreconcilable differences, and a judge would not impose any penalties on my wife for her infidelity. The lawyer assured me that the necessary divorce paperwork would be prepared by the next day. I confided in a trusted friend at work about my situation, explaining that I might need to leave work unexpectedly if the camera alerted me to any significant developments. This setup allowed me to monitor my wife's actions remotely throughout that day. To my dismay, I observed my wife in the backyard searching for her marijuana stash, she appeared visibly frustrated during her search before eventually retreating inside the house. I had my phone on standby, prepared to react if she were to invite her affair partner over again. Instead, she got into her car and drove off. Thanks to the GPS system I had installed, I was able to track her location in real time. She ventured to an unfamiliar destination, remaining there for approximately 30 minutes before returning home. I noted the location for further investigation, eager to uncover the truth about where she had been. Although I felt a twinge of disappointment that the day had not unfolded according to my plans, I took solace in the fact that I now had insight into her activities. Upon her return home, she headed straight to the backyard, where she lit up some marijuana and concealed the remainder in the same hiding spot. This action appeared to confirm my suspicion that she had left to procure more from her affair partner. 
One crucial detail I had almost overlooked was that once I became aware of her infidelity, I made the decision to undergo an STD test. Fortunately, the results returned negative. Since I captured her affair partner on the ring camera, there has been no intimacy between my wife and me, a significant shift in our relationship dynamics, considering I had historically been the one to initiate such moments. She has not actively pursued any reconciliation with me, which adds to the emotional turmoil I am currently experiencing. Compounding this distress is the fact that she is already romantically involved with her affair partner, leading me to strongly suspect that during her most recent visit to him, they engaged in a physical relationship. The timing of her visit raises numerous questions, there seemed to be no other plausible reason for her to spend 30 minutes at that location after work. A subsequent investigation into the area revealed that she had actually visited a mechanic shop, a discovery that both surprised and angered me. What made my anger intensify was spotting the unmistakable 1964 Pontiac GTO parked there, the same car I had seen on my street the day I nearly caught someone fleeing from my backyard. The realization that this man had been inside my home filled me with a profound sense of disrespect and violation. I felt a strong urge to confront him on the spot, but I had to restrain myself. The thought that he seemed so familiar with my backyard suggested he might have been there on previous occasions, a notion that was both unsettling and infuriating. To gather more evidence, I parked my work van a few blocks away from the mechanic shop, intent on observing the situation as if conducting a stakeout. As the evening wore on, I remained vigilant. Eventually, I saw him emerge from the shop alongside another man. They closed the garage doors and stood outside, presumably taking a break to smoke. From my vantage point, I could not conclusively determine whether they were smoking cigarettes or marijuana, as the distance kept me from clearly identifying the substance. Although I should have been on my way home, the urge to stay and monitor their activities proved too strong to resist. As I waited, my mind spiraled into a comparison between myself and this man, filled with self-doubt and questions about why my wife had chosen him over me. There had to be something about his life that excited her, something I could not replicate. Perhaps she had grown tired of the pretense of being a good person and decided to embrace her true nature. Once they finished smoking, he got into his vehicle and drove away, prompting me to see this as an opportunity to follow and discover his home address. Having already been to my house multiple times and engaged with my wife, it seemed only fair that I should uncover where he resided, driven by a desire to disrupt whatever relationship he had with my wife. Dark thoughts coursed through my mind, at that moment, I possessed a concealed hand tool, a Springfield Hellcat, stored in my vehicle. The idea of confronting him directly and taking matters into my own hands crossed my mind, but I quickly realized that doing so would likely make me the prime suspect should anything happen and they connected him to my wife. He eventually drove to a restaurant, where he picked up a woman. Initially, I assumed she was his girlfriend, prompting me to take several photographs with my phone, though the fading light made it difficult to capture clear images. I remained parked on the street, striving to stay inconspicuous as I observed his interactions. Upon collecting the woman, they drove to an apartment building with street parking. From their body language and the way they interacted, it became evident that she was not merely a friend, their behavior hinted at a strong mutual attraction, raising my suspicions that she might be yet another one of the women involved with him romantically. As I weighed whether to wait for him to exit the apartment so I could follow and uncover more information about him, the uncertainty of how long he would stay prompted me to take a photograph of his license plate instead. I then returned home, but the knowledge that this man was not merely a dealer but also a womanizer, with my wife being one of his entangled affairs, weighed heavily on my mind. In the subsequent days, my emotional state deteriorated further. Each moment spent in her presence became increasingly disheartening, making it arduous to share the same space with her. I found myself losing hope and seriously contemplating the finality of divorce, a means to extricate ourselves from this painful entanglement. This looming decision was compounded by an underlying fear that she would eventually figure out the purpose of the ring doorbell, discover the voice-activated recorder, or notice the hidden camera I had been using to monitor her actions. The week dragged on monotonously, filled with moments of watching her converse with her affair partner, as well as capturing footage of her smoking in the backyard at least twice daily. An estimate suggested that her MJ stash would last approximately three to four weeks, a timeline I found unbearable. The thought of enduring the presence of my wife in the same house, knowing she was involved with another man, became increasingly intolerable. The need to bring this matter to a close compelled me to take decisive action. As night fell and she settled into bed, I quietly made my way to the backyard armed with a flashlight. There, I unearthed her stash of marijuana, which I found was mixed with tobacco. 
After careful consideration, I decided to remove more than half of the contents, leaving the remainder intact before returning to bed, hoping this would mitigate ongoing issues. The following morning, as I left for work, I checked the security camera footage and observed her smoking, confirming that my efforts had gone unnoticed. Three days have passed since that event, and during this time, I have been diligently organizing my financial documents. Aside from the shared bank account, which holds minimal funds, and our fully paid off house, there is little left to divide other than our retirement savings. My wife's 401k contains about $45,000, while my Roth account reflects a significantly larger sum of around $870,000. I anticipate that she may attempt to stake a claim to a portion of my Roth account. According to my legal counsel, it is likely that, due to the length of our marriage, I will need to allocate a segment of my retirement savings to her. However, she remains unaware of the precise value of my Roth account, having always shown a lack of interest in retirement planning. I have been the primary earner and financial planner, while her focus has primarily been on spending. In fact, it took considerable persuasion on my part to get her to open a 401k account nine years ago, which she has contributed to minimally. The majority of that savings can be seen as essentially untouched, almost like free money. Throughout our marriage, she has relied on me while frequently expressing dissatisfaction with my work commitments, often accusing me of not taking enough time off. Our initial plan was to retire early, driven by my dedication to providing a stable future for our family. With our children now adults, we had envisioned relocating to South America to enjoy a fulfilling life together. However, her recent actions suggest that she has emotionally divorced herself from our relationship and is now involved in an extramarital affair. The prospect of her claiming half of the hard work and effort I have invested over the years is distressing. My attorney has emphasized that, typically, longer marriages lead to a more equitable division of retirement assets, a scenario I cannot allow to unfold. My assets, earned through steadfast labor, cannot be wasted or improperly allocated. I have upheld my responsibilities as a loyal and caring husband, striving to ensure the happiness of my family. In stark contrast to my devotion, she has chosen to engage in a relationship with another man. Based on recorded conversations, it appears she does not intend to leave me for this individual but rather enjoys the excitement that accompanies a fleeting romance. She seems to cherish the thrill without being willing to sacrifice the stable life we have built together. In her recorded comments, she has shared laughter in response to his attempts to persuade her to leave me, despite his own commitments to a girlfriend and young children. Listening to the recordings has proven to be emotionally challenging, revealing unflattering perceptions she holds about me. She has referred to me as boring and unadventurous and has expressed dissatisfaction with our intimate life, inaccurately labeling me poorly in that regard. I suspect her critiques are more about inflating his ego than an accurate assessment of our relationship dynamics. The man in question is only 32 years old, younger than I initially assumed, likely because the baseball group I observed him with appeared to consist of men in their 40s. His frequent compliments seem to bolster her fragile self-esteem, indicating a pattern where younger men target middle-aged women with confidence issues, creating an environment conducive to intimate relationships. Through the pursuit of the man's identity, facilitated by his license plate, I managed to uncover the details of his residence. I conducted surveillance by passing by his home on several occasions. During these observations, I noted that he has a girlfriend and three children, all under the age of 10. In an unexpected twist, while my wife and I were in bed one evening, she initiated an intimate encounter, an event I cannot recall happening in a long time. I informed her that I was too fatigued to engage in intimacy, which understandably upset her, particularly due to the fact that we had not been physically close for several weeks. My reluctance to reconnect with her in that manner stemmed from my knowledge of her ongoing involvement with her affair partner. Instead of revealing the true source of my hesitance, I provided the excuse that I had endured a demanding week at work. However, the reality was more complex, I still found her physically attractive and did desire intimacy with her. Nonetheless, I perceived her as tainted, akin to someone engaging in street solicitation, which created a profound conflict within me. The thought of being intimate with her felt as though it would indirectly validate her actions and choices, which I could not condone. Two days later, while I was at work, I received a notification from my ring doorbell. Curiosity compelled me to check it immediately, and I was met with the alarming sight of my wife having invited her affair partner into our home. Disturbingly, this behavior mirrored previous encounters, however, on this occasion, I was not far away, merely about 15 minutes from home. The urgency of the situation propelled me into my car, and I made the journey back in less than 10 minutes, driven by a mix of emotions. 
To avoid drawing attention to my arrival, I opted not to park in the driveway. Instead, I chose to leave my vehicle on the street. My Hellcat, a personal protection tool I routinely carried, was with me, although I had not anticipated needing it during this particular moment. Emotionally, I felt prepared after contemplating the potential for confrontation. My objective was not to take a life, despite my intense feelings of indignation toward the man who disrespected me and my marriage. Rather, I aimed to confront him at gunpoint and subsequently call the authorities, hoping he might have illicit substances on him, which would lead to his arrest. I made sure my phone was set to record, discreetly placing it in my left shirt pocket to capture audio without needing to hold it, thereby avoiding any additional attention. Knowing that the backyard might serve as the man's escape route, I chose that path to enter my home. Approximately 20 minutes had elapsed since I received the notification on my phone. Carefully maneuvering, I slid the bolt of the wooden fence gate latch to open it from the outside, all while ensuring my camera continued to record. Upon entering through the backyard door that led into the kitchen, I held my keys in my right hand and my Hellcat in my left. The kitchen and backyard doors were wide open, providing a direct line of sight into the living room. It was there that I found my wife and her affair partner, both unclothed, engaged in an intimate act on our living room couch. The open floor plan allowed me to observe the scene clearly from my vantage point in the kitchen. In a moment of shock and indignation, I dropped my keys on the floor to free my hands and firmly grasp my Hellcat. Both of them were taken aback upon my sudden appearance. Without hesitation, I issued commands for them to lie down on the floor, making it clear that failure to comply would result in serious consequences. The man reacted quickly, dropping to the ground, though he was partially dressed, and attempted to put on his pants. I ordered him to stop. My wife, who now wore a robe, attempted to de-escalate the situation by assuring me that it was not what it seemed. I made a conscious effort to ensure my recording device remained operational, as my left arm had partially obstructed the view. I continued to point my Hellcat at her affair partner while expressing my anger through curses. My wife, now in a robe, slowly attempted to rise, and I allowed her to do so while continuing to focus on the man. I ordered her to join him and stay flat on the ground, which effectively communicated the seriousness of my actions, prompting her to comply without further protest. Afterward, I reviewed the recorded footage to capture the details accurately, recognizing that adrenaline had heightened my emotions and perceptions during the encounter. I understood the necessity of establishing control over the situation before contacting the police. With my wife on the floor, apologizing and insisting that her affair partner, Craig, meant nothing to her, the situation intensified as he began to beg for mercy, pleading with me not to harm him. In that tense moment, I took out my phone and dialed emergency services, informing the dispatcher that a drug dealer was in my house selling to my wife, and that I had them both at gunpoint. The dispatcher calmly instructed me not to take any action until the police arrived, emphasizing the importance of maintaining safety. After concluding the call, I directed Craig to stretch both his hands forward while remaining on the ground, further asserting my control over an exceedingly volatile situation. He pleaded with me, desperately trying to avoid any escalation that might necessitate the use of force. My wife remained on the floor, continuing her appeals for calm. In a moment of resolve, I walked over to the front door and swung it wide open, ensuring that the police would find it easy to enter when they arrived. As I stood there, my gaze fell upon a small bag of marijuana on the living room table. While the quantity was not significant, I hoped it would be enough to prompt the police to make an arrest. The minutes dragged on, stretching into what felt like an eternity, roughly five minutes in reality. I grew weary of maintaining the atmosphere of terror for both of them, all the while recording the entire incident for my records. In an effort to seek some clarity and perhaps confront the situation head-on, I decided to FaceTime my daughter, despite my wife's pleas to refrain from doing so. When my daughter answered, she was met with a shocking scene, her mother lying on the floor alongside her semi-naked affair partner. I quickly explained the gravity of the situation, and her reaction was immediate, she began to cry, unable to comprehend the betrayal unfolding before her. My wife, visibly embarrassed, lowered her head in shame as our daughter spoke. In that tense moment, I suddenly heard the unmistakable sound of police vehicles pulling into the driveway. As they entered the house, I lowered my Hellcat key fob and approached them at the door to provide a briefing on the situation. Initially, two officers arrived, but their numbers quickly grew to four as two additional patrol cars pulled up. The first officers at the scene detained my wife's partner for the marijuana found in the living room. He attempted to deflect responsibility by claiming that the substance was my wife's, not his. 
It was somewhat amusing watching them both hurl accusations at each other, effectively incriminating themselves in the process. My wife vehemently denied ownership, insisting it belonged to him, while he unwittingly admitted to having sold it to her, thereby relinquishing any claim of ownership. In hindsight, I realized that I should have informed the police that the marijuana was my wife's, this detail would become crucial as events unfolded. The officers were unable to definitively ascertain ownership, so they made the decision to detain both of them. Now, three patrol cars were parked in front of my residence, and they placed my wife in one of them, allowing her to put on her clothes while still donning her robe. This moment was particularly embarrassing, given that all the responding officers were male and witnessed my wife in a partially unclothed state. I felt a wave of discomfort wash over me, but I quickly reminded myself that under the circumstances, her actions had rendered her a matter of public record due to her involvement with this unsavory individual. As the officers weighed the marijuana, they determined it to be approximately four ounces, teetering on the edge of being classified as a state jail felony. One of the officers later confided in me privately that there was a possibility the judge might reduce the charge to a Class A misdemeanor possession if it was established definitively that the marijuana belonged to my wife. At this point, I harbored a strong desire for the police to take decisive action against my wife's affair partner. The police escorted him to his car, intending to search for further evidence related to his activities. However, he stubbornly refused to comply, asserting that they required a warrant to conduct such a search. In response, the officer pointed out that they had probable cause to believe the vehicle contained evidence of criminal activity, given that he had previously admitted to providing the marijuana to my wife, essentially acknowledging his intent to distribute or sell. It soon became clear that an unusual number of officers had responded to the scene, which made me wonder if they were handling an exceptionally significant case. Even the K-9 unit arrived, indicative of the serious approach they intended to take with this matter, especially considering my wife's partner's prior criminal record. The police were clearly committed to ensuring that he would face substantial legal consequences for his actions. After conducting a thorough search, the police discovered approximately four pounds of marijuana in his possession, enough to warrant charges related to a state jail felony. The legal ramifications of his offense were serious, carrying a mandatory minimum sentence of 180 days in prison, with a potential maximum of two years and fines reaching up to $10,000. The evidence against him appeared robust, although the specifics of his previous offenses remained unclear. It was likely he would face significant prison time as a result of this incident. I questioned whether an affair with another man's wife was worth the ensuing legal troubles, but it was evident he had chosen the wrong individual with whom to become entangled. Ultimately, the police charged him with possession of the marijuana found in my home and subsequently released my wife. He was taken away in handcuffs while his friend later arrived to retrieve his vehicle. I also made it clear to the police that I wished to pursue charges against him for trespassing, ensuring that all necessary repercussions would be pursued for his reckless actions. The officers informed me that my wife's affair partner could not be charged with trespassing, as infidelity is not classified as a criminal offense. Furthermore, they noted that he had been invited into our home by my wife, which further complicated the issue. The officers mentioned that they might require my presence at the police station for additional statements, despite the fact that I had already provided my account of the incident. After my wife was released from the police vehicle, she hurried into our bedroom and locked the door behind her. In the midst of this turmoil, my daughter reached out to me, revealing that my wife had been attempting to contact her, but she had chosen to ignore those calls. Concerned and distressed, my daughter asked for details about what had occurred. I recounted the entire, painful story, and throughout the conversation, she remained in tears. Although I felt some remorse about having live-streamed the situation involving my wife and her affair partner, I recognized it was not my fault. It was my wife who had placed us all in this predicament, and I did not believe I should shoulder the full weight of the consequences alone. As our conversation progressed, my daughter sought clarity regarding the next steps. I informed her that I had already taken action by hiring a real estate agent, and we would be putting the house on the market. Additionally, I shared that I had retained a divorce lawyer and that the divorce agreement was already drafted, all that was left was to serve it to her. She told me that she planned to visit us the following week, and I understood that this situation would be particularly challenging for her given her close relationship with her mother. As evening approached, I found myself grappling with mixed emotions surrounding the entire situation. My wife remained locked away in the bedroom, and I felt an overwhelming sadness wash over me as I contemplated the disintegration of our 22-year marriage. Reflecting on our shared history, I was struck by the reality that there were no clear heroes in this narrative. This was not how I had imagined our relationship coming to an end. 
Just two years prior, we had enjoyed a vacation in South America, exploring countries such as Uruguay, Chile, and Peru, with the intent of finding a new home. It was difficult to fathom that in a single year, my wife had dismantled everything we had built together. I was taken aback by her reckless decision to invite her affair partner into our home. However, in a way, it was a shocking revelation that ultimately exposed her true nature. One could only speculate whether this was an isolated incident or part of a larger pattern, as it raised uncertainties about potential past indiscretions. Later that evening, I sought solace in a local bar, where I met with a friend for drinks and conversation. We discussed various topics, deliberately avoiding any mention of my wife or the distressing events of the day. I aimed to distract myself from the turmoil surrounding me. While at the bar, my eldest son called. He had learned about the situation from his sister and expressed his regret regarding his mother's actions. He assured me of his unwavering support for any decisions I chose to make moving forward. My son understood that it was my wife's choices that had put our family in this difficult predicament, and hearing his words filled me with pride, highlighting his maturity during such a challenging time. He also mentioned that he had a serious girlfriend with whom he was living. In the past, I had given him advice on relationships, but in this instance, I found myself in need of guidance. When I returned home that night, I opted to avoid seeing my wife and chose to sleep in a separate room. The following day at work, I spoke with my youngest son, sharing the burden of my feelings. I also confided in a colleague about the unsettling events that had transpired, and he offered his support, expressing understanding if I required any time off to navigate the divorce process. I decided to leave work early to visit my lawyer's office before it closed. There, I collected the divorce agreement that needed my wife's signature and reached out to the real estate agent to initiate the process of listing our home on the multiple listing service, MLS. The agent informed me that she would come by over the weekend to take photographs for the listing. Upon returning home, I found my wife waiting for me. She expressed a desire to talk, but I made it clear that I would not engage in any discussion until she had signed the divorce papers. She insisted on having the opportunity to speak first, promising that she would sign the paperwork afterward. My wife even suggested that if I refused to allow her to talk, she might prolong the divorce process. I reminded her that she was in no position to issue threats, given the circumstances surrounding her actions. I made it clear that if she wanted a public divorce, I was fully prepared to escalate the matter to the Supreme Court. This response seemed to calm her, as she realized that my resolve was not merely empty rhetoric. She requested that I bring the divorce papers for her to sign but also asked for clarification regarding the terms outlined in the agreement. Prior to finalizing the divorce documents, I took the initiative to inform her of our mutual decision to sell the house. We agreed that the proceeds from the sale would be divided, with a 60-40th split favoring her. As part of this arrangement, she would receive $4,000 from the balance in our joint account. In return for this financial settlement, she consented to an amicable divorce and assured me that she would not pursue any claims on my retirement assets. She expressed that this arrangement was fair, and I found myself in agreement with her perspective. Once she had signed the necessary papers, she conveyed a desire to discuss the origins of her affair, wanting to provide me with details regarding her involvement. To her surprise, I revealed that I was already well aware of the situation. I disclosed that I had been monitoring her interactions with her affair partner through surveillance cameras and voice recorders, even pointing out the location where she had hidden her marijuana. Her reaction was one of shock, and she fell silent, realizing that I had been privy to more than she anticipated. I was not interested in hearing her justifications or explanations. She understood the severity of her actions, and while her tears may have been an attempt to elicit sympathy, I remained steadfast, fully aware that the decisions made could not be undone. It has now been two weeks since I served her with the divorce papers, leaving us with 76 days until the divorce is finalized. As of this moment, the house remains unsold, however, there are two promising inquiries from potential buyers that might lead to a sale soon. Despite the circumstances, my soon-to-be ex-wife and I continue to share the same living space, with each of us occupying separate bedrooms. Our daughter has chosen to sever communication with her mother, and I have assumed the role of mediator in hopes of mending their relationship. My sons, while still in contact with their mother, have experienced a significant decline in their respect for her actions. I have come to accept the reality that my family structure will never return to what it once was. In regard to her affair partner, I have learned that he was recently released on bail but is still navigating the legal system as his court proceedings remain pending.
There are indications that he could face a prison sentence that exceeds two years, a situation I find myself observing with a sense of detachment, recognizing the complexity of the aftermath we are all experiencing.